Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar for this evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is part four of our four-part series on student speech. Tonight's session is intended for students, though if you're not a student, you're more than welcome to participate. Um, and the session covers the Mahanoy v. BL case, which will be headed to the Supreme Court uh, very shortly. Um, arguments are, are this month. We are recording, and this recording will be available on Street Law's YouTube uh, page, which you can Google to find. Here's our agenda for our short one hour webinar. So we're gonna cover some introductions to start. Uh, then we're going to go through the facts, the precedents and the arguments of the case, because this is a case that many people are not familiar with. We wanted to make sure that you were familiar with the case before we spend most of our time in the session um, in a Q&A with our guest expert, Bob Horn Revere. These are our objectives for uh, this session and also the other student session if you happen to attend both of them. Um, so students who attend this session in particular will understand the Mahanoy case a lot better, the facts, the constitutional issue, precedence, and the arguments. Um, and then if you've attended both sessions, but even actually if you haven't, um, you should be able to draw some connections between the Tinker case and the Mahanoy case because we'll be talking a little bit about the Tinker case today. So very shortly, some, uh, uh, Ben is going to put up a poll uh, here on Zoom. The poll is just going to ask you to tell us who you are. Um, and when you get a chance, there it is, uh, click who you are and submit it for us. This helps us figure out who we're talking to. And yeah. There's mainly one way to participate in today's webinar, and that's through the Q&A. Um, the Q&A should be used for questions that you have for our guest expert, Bob Corn Revere. Um, to get to the Q&A button, you'll wanna scroll down to the black uh, Zoom panel and you'll see a Q&A um, button that's there, icon that's there. You can submit questions at any point uh, throughout the webinar and they'll just kind of pile up um, in, in the, in the Q&A box. You can also comment on questions if you have follow-up. A couple of introductions. So first of all, we are Street Law. Uh, Street Law has been around for almost 50 years. Um, we have uh, experience developing programs and curricula that teach young people about the law and how to use it as a positive force in their lives. We do work in teacher professional development, legal community partnerships, legal life skills, global law and democracy programs and curricula and teaching materials. And we're actually gonna show you some teaching materials that uh, are ready for students to use. They're not just meant for teachers to use toward the end of the webinar. My name is Jen Wheeler. Uh, I am part one half of the teacher professional development team. I'm joined by my colleague, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy, I'm the other half. <laughs> uh, I'm also joined by our intern, Mary Liz. I am Mary Liz. I'm a senior in high school. And Mary Liz is on spring break right now. So we're very thankful that she's dedicated enough to, to join us during her spring break. And we're also joined by our, by our guest expert, Bob Corn Revere. Bob is a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine. He is a former FCC official, a Supreme Court advocate in First Amendment cases. He's the outside counsel for the Stand Up for Speech Initiative, which litigates campus free speech cases. And one of the reasons why he's especially a great expert for tonight is he's the author of an amicus brief for the Tinkers in the Mahanoy case. So an amicus brief, if you're unfamiliar with that term, is uh, a brief that's submitted uh, by a party interested in the case, but not involved in the case. They submit that brief to the Supreme Court to make their own legal arguments. Bob, you want to say hi and add anything I might have missed? Uh, hi, everybody, and I uh, appreciate your, your attending. Uh, I think that pretty well covers it. Uh, and and um, some cases more than others attract um, uh, amicus briefs or amicus briefs. You can pronounce it either way. Um, this case, uh, there have been 35 amicus briefs filed. Uh, so uh, it's attracted quite a lot of interest. That's great. Thanks for that. 
So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy, Mary Liz, and Bob, who are gonna take us through uh, the next couple sections to tell us more about this case. Okay, so we're gonna start from the beginning. Uh, probably some of you know about this case, but we're not gonna assume that you know anything. So we'll start from the very beginning. This case is called Mahanoy Area School District VBL. And um, the student's initials are used because she's a minor. So um, we actually find out from, from interviews she's done on television that her name is Brandy Levy, but we're gonna, re we're gonna refer to her as BL because that's the name in the case. This is a picture of her in her Mahanoy uh, cheerleading uniform sitting on the 50 yard line. Okay, so there's some facts you need to know about this case. First of all, um, sort of the background of this case is that BL was a sophomore at a public school, and that's going to be really important in what we talk about today. This case would not be before the court if she was a, a student at a, at a private school. So she was a JV cheerleader as a freshman, and she was really hoping to make the varsity team as a sophomore. So at the end of her freshman year, she tried out and when the um, roster was posted, she found out that she was on JV again. She was really upset about this. Um, she also was having some disappointments with a private softball team she was on, and it was the middle of exams. So she Snapchatted. Um, she was at a store, as, as high school girls often are. She was out at a store on a Saturday, not on campus, and she Snapchatted um, a picture of her and her friend, high school friend, a student at the school, um, raising their middle fingers and captioned it, F school, F softball, F cheer, F everything. Now we need to keep this PG-13. So we have left the, uh, we put the little asterisks in there. She did not use asterisks. She wrote out the word in full. Um, and so that's an important part of this case as well. There was a second snap that said, uh, love how me and a redacted name of a student get told we need a year of JV before we make varsity, but that doesn't matter to anyone else and a little upside down smiley face. Um, that snap isn't really the focus of this case. This snap is the one that's on the screen in front of you. Um, so as we know, snaps go away after 24 hours, they disappear, but um, we, I think most users also know, and Snapchat actually cautions users, that a screenshot can be taken of your snap. And then that, of course, does not disappear in 24 hours. And people can do with that whatever they like. Um, and in this case, it was shared by another cheerleader on the team with her mother, who is a coach on the team. Um, and when the coaches uh, looked at this, the snap, the screenshot of the snap, they decided that it broke the rules that, um, that BL had agreed to follow, which said things like she couldn't use vulgar language, she couldn't criticize the cheerleading team or other cheerleaders. Um, and so she was suspended from the cheerleading team for a year, not, not academic courses, um, and she had no other disciplinary measures, but she was not allowed to participate in the cheerleading team for a year. So of course this case, um, the, the constitutional provision at question in this case is the First Amendment that says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. So BL contends that because she was disciplined um, by being suspended from the team for her speech in her SNAP, um, that the school has taken away her First Amendment right. Um, even though the First Amendment says Congress, the 14th Amendment later on Help to help to make sure that those rights were also um, protected from state action. And teachers are, um, because they're public, because it's public school, teachers are agents. <coughs> of the state. So that's how it gets to the school from Congress. Okay, so we're going to look at precedent. Some of you are probably in government classes and know that when you study a case, one of the things you have to look at are similar cases that took place in the past. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Liz. Okay, um, Bob, would you please explain what a president is and why we care about them? 
Okay. Oh, you may have heard the expression, we live in a, a society governed by uh, laws and not men. And it's a question of how you apply the rule of law. When courts make decisions, they take either a statute or a, a series of laws and interpret it and apply it to a set of facts. And so that the law can be understandable and consistent, so there's some predictability, later courts that address you know, the same statute or the same constitutional provision will try and interpret it the same way. And you look at whether or not the facts of the given case are fit, uh, fit within that uh, line of authority and so on. And particularly at the higher levels, when you're talking about a Supreme Court precedent, all other courts in the country, both lower federal courts and state courts, are bound to follow that rule as set down by the Supreme Court. And so you look to see whether or not um, a given case that comes up fits within that same factual scenario, whether it's governed by the same rule of law. And that precedent then, dictate is probably too strong a word, but helps determine how those later cases will be decided so that there's some kind of predictability. And so how does the Supreme Court apply precedence to later cases? Okay, uh, well, it does so in a couple of ways. One, it looks at the basic legal rule that you're trying to apply, and that is the government can't censor speech. That's a basic rule, and then you look to see how that rule applies in different settings, in different situations. Um, and then if it's really not the same situation, the same set of facts, then you might say those cases are distinguished. In this case, and we'll get to this more uh, as we get into the discussion of the specific cases, but the Tinker case uh, involved students in school wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. Those were the facts of that case. This case involves a student off campus using social media and communicating her ideas or her upset about uh, how she felt she was being treated by the cheerleading squad and by school. Uh, and so the question is, are these factual situations enough the same? Are they similar enough to fall within the same rule? Or does a different rule apply? Great, so we're gonna look at three precedents that are especially important. There are lots of precedents that okay. apply to this case, but we're gonna look at the three probably most important. Um, starting with Tinker v. Des Moines, and you already heard Bob tell you a little bit about this case. This is Mary Beth Tinker and her brother John Tinker, and they and a friend um, and some other classmates wore armbands in protest of the Vietnam War. Um, it was a silent protest, so they didn't say any words. Um, it was just the symbol of the black armband, which is generally symbolic of loss or death or mourning. Um, and they wore them to school. Uh, the school got wind of their planned protest and passed a rule right before saying um, anybody who wears a black armband to school will be suspended. So they were suspended and um, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a special interest group that helps support um, things like cases like this, um, helped them take their case the whole way to the Supreme Court. And at the Supreme Court, the um, the decision was that they were this was within their rights to wear that um, that they didn't cause a disruption and um, that students uh, this fame this is the famous quote from the opinion by Abe Fortas um, that I that it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. And it set up a really important test, sometimes called the substantial disruption test or the tinker test, that said that if something materially disrupts classwork or involves substantial disorder or invasion of the rights of others, that those things can be, um, can be stopped. But if it doesn't, then it can't. How might Tinker v. Des Moines be applied to Mahanoy? Are you asking me? <laughs> I am. <laughs> okay. Um, well, as um, 
you know, as we heard, Tinker set the basic rule that students, when they attend public school, are still citizens. They still have First Amendment rights. And the question is, how do you balance those rights with the needs of being able to have a school that isn't disrupted by uh, different types of expression? And how do you um, enforce a rule that, lim that protects speech but prevents invading the rights of others? And that's the issue that ever since 1969, and the Supreme Court decided that case, courts have struggled with as they apply it to different factual situations. Now, BL presents a case that, a set of facts that has been percolating through the lower courts for a number of years now, ever since social media has been uh, more prevalent in society. And the question is, how do you apply that rule, which preserves the authority of government to a certain degree over speech in schools, when the speech takes place outside the schools and yet students in school still can read it, hear it, see it. And, um, you know, whether or not that authority extends beyond school to speech outside. Um, I, I think you start with the premise that students have rights. The rule of Tinker was that the First Amendment does protect students in public schools. And the question is, how broad an exception are you going to recognize um, for the government's ability to, to regulate speech? In this case, the question is whether or not a, a, um, a um, Snapchat post on social media um, is sufficiently disruptive to permit the government to um, sanction the student in this case. Uh, you know, the substantial disruption test is one that can be very subjective. And th the question in this case is whether or not that's the kind of test you would apply to, you know, someone's social media activity that might make someone upset. Now, is making someone go to their, their mom, the coach, and express displeasure, uh, or even the school authorities being upset that a, a student at their school would use such language on social media, is that enough of a disruption to restrict a person's right to generally communicate online? Uh, that's really the question here. And I think the how you answer that question will, de will be determined by what your threshold is for preserving basic rights like First Amendment rights versus the school's authority over that and particularly as you extend that authority beyond the confines of the school and apply it to essentially all communications because if you post something on social media it's available to everybody worldwide and so uh, the question is whether or not uh, you think this is sufficiently disruptive to extend the government's authority over essentially all speech by students that could be uh, uh, perceived in the school. Sorry. The second case that we're going to look at as a precedent is Bethel School District v. Frazier. So in this case, Matthew Frazier, who you see pictured there, um, was giving a speech in a, on stage at a school assembly and it was for a student council type election. And he was offering a speech in support of another candidate. And he didn't use any, what we would call swear words like BL did, but he used um, sexual innuendo, he used double entendres, you know what that means, to, to make the this, this speech itself, you know, kind of obscene. And lewd was the word that was used a lot in this case. Um, so it caused a, it did certainly cause rumblings in the cafeteria or in the, in the auditorium that day. And it did, um, you know, students were talking about it and things like that. Um, so he was suspended as well and took his case to the Supreme Court. And in this case, the Supreme Court found for the school and said that schools can prohibit the use of lewd, indecent, or plainly offensive language, even if it is not obscene, within the school setting. So that's important. It's not on the screen, but um, within school. And um, that schools have an interest in, present in preventing speech that is inconsistent with the school's basic educational mission. 
Um, so a lot of people feel like this case uh, chipped away at Tinker. And then Bob, how might the decision in this case be applied to Mahanoy? Well, I think if you uh, listen to the petitioners in this case, the ones who are trying to have the lower court decision overturned, they would say that it applies directly because uh, the, um, uh, the kind of speech, offensive uh, speech, uh, is something that schools have the authority to, to limit. But here, I think, as we were talking about the difference between the rule of law and the facts and how you apply one to the other, here, the facts were that this was a school assembly. It was something being done at the school under school sponsorship, part of a school election. And the question was whether or not the school has a greater interest or greater authority to regulate speech in that setting. Um, and the court in 1986 decided that yes, the schools do have authority here. The question in this case is whether or not that authority extends to all student speech out in the world and online. And there, I think you're stretching beyond the bounds of what the court decided in Bethel School District. Uh, and, and articulating a much broader rule that would give school authorities the ability to control speech by students everywhere. Good. And Morse v. Frederick is really the last big student speech case that has reached the Supreme Court. Um, we usually refer to this case as the bong hits for Jesus case. Um, for the reasons that you can see there. So this case is a really interesting case because it has on school and in school and out of school both. So in this case, um, the school that uh, Joseph Frederick went to was taking students, allowing students time out of the school day to walk to a nearby road to see the Olympic torch being, um, you know, taken down the road at the time of the Olympics. And so they, it was during school time, but it was a release from school and teachers were there as well. The band was there, the cheerleaders were there. There was a school presence at the road as the Olympic torch was, was um, taken by. So um, Joseph Frederick, however, didn't come to school that morning. So he was probably home busily making this banner um, that's made out of duct tape um, that says bong hits for Jesus. And um, when asked why he chose that slogan, he said that he had seen it on a snowboard and that it um, makes him, you know, that it, he was curious about it. And uh, he thought that it would get him on TV. So he thought this is, this is something that the TV cameras are gonna swing around. I'm gonna get on TV if I take this and unfurl it. So he joins his classmates um, on the road before the torch comes by. And as the torch is going by, they unfurl this banner. Um, the principal, Principal Morse was not pleased with that and uh, took the banner and, um, and suspended um, Frederick. And so this case went to the Supreme Court and in this case, the Supreme Court found that, uh, first of all, they had to decide, was he at school or was he not at school before they found, you know, considered the other question. They decided that he was at school, that it was an approved trip, that, the, like I said, the teachers were there, the band was there. He joined his classmates. You can see that in this picture. So they, first of all, decided that he was present at the school event, so he was at school. Um, and the other students were at school too, because that was a question since they, since they left the school grounds, were they still under the school rules? So yes, they were. And yes, even though he didn't attend that morning, he was as well. And then they had to decide whether or not um, it was appropriate for the teacher to take, for the principal to take action. And they decided that um, because the word bong is drug related, that this may um, have promoted illegal drug use. And in that case, um, that's something that's been pretty clearly established that schools can restrict things that promote gun use or gang violence or things like that. Okay, so Bob, again, how might the decision in Morse v. Frederick be applied to Mahanoy? Well, again, this is one of those decisions that recognized expanded school authority to regulate speech in schools that uh, would not be recognized outside of schools. And so the question in this case is whether or not the kinds of uh, regulation that was allowed 
in uh, Morris versus Frederick can be extended to the facts of this case. Now, there are a couple of interesting features. Well, there are many, but uh, I'll focus on just a couple of interesting features uh, involving uh, where the court was going with this case. Uh, one is the fact that note how few decisions the Supreme Court has issued in the area of uh, student speech below the college level. Um, since 1969, there have been three. Uh, and so uh, in terms of this kind of, of application of the Tinker Test, uh, there are the two that we've talked about here. There's one other one involving student newspapers, uh, the Hazelwood decision. Um, and in all of those decisions since Tinker, uh, the court has recognized the ability of the school to regulate in those specific circumstances. Uh, so at a school assembly or here, uh, at a school-sponsored event. Now, to reach that conclusion, the court had to stretch in a couple of ways beyond, I think, what the facts might have justified. Uh, in this case, uh, because uh, it was outside the school, and actually this, the people were holding the banner, the kids were holding the banner up um, across the street from the school. Um, the, and, and in fact, they had been let out of school for the rest of the day as the uh, parade was was going to go by. Um, the court nevertheless said this was a school-sponsored event because they were still being supervised by teachers and, and members of the school and they had officially been uh, allowed to uh, watch the uh, Olympic torch. Um, and so it extended, I think, a, a little further to fit this case within the framework of saying this was a school-sponsored event. The second way in which I thought there was a bit of a stretch is calling the uh, the expression bong hits for Jesus a pro-drug message uh, to make it fit within that body of law that says this, that schools can regulate uh, um, the advocacy of drug usage. Uh, this is really sort of a nonsense phrase as uh, Kathy mentioned. Um, it was one that came from a snowboard and basically so that the student would, would get attention uh, based on it. Um, it's really a stretch to call it a pro-drug message, but I think the court interpreted it that way so that it would fit within the rule of law that had been previously established that a school-sponsored events, you have greater control and also uh, you can prevent uh, pro-drug messages. As a matter of fact, one of the justices, Justice Alito, in uh, a concurring statement said, had this expression been able to be interpret interpreted in any way as saying a pro-drug legalization message, a political message, uh, that uh, he would have been likely to find that it was protected. So uh, it's really interesting in, in that way too. But Mary Liz, for the question that you asked about how it would apply to this case, again, it's going to be a question of whether or not uh, the court is willing to stretch in the same way in this case as it did in Morris versus Frederick uh, to sort of fit the facts within an existing rule of law. Um, you know, if you're going to stretch and say that speech that can be um, discussed wherever it's expressed, if it reaches the school, if it can be discussed by students in the school, that that is in school speech or school sponsored speech in some way, um, school or speech directed at the school, then um, uh, the court may be inclined to recognize school authority over uh, the uh, student speech. If on the other hand, uh, the court is not as willing to stretch in this case as it has in, in past cases and to m apply more the basic rule of tinker that students have, have uh, First Amendment rights, particularly outside the school, uh, then it's likely to go the other way. Bob, there was a question, and I think Jim might have answered it um, by typing, but I guess I wasn't clear about the decision in um, Morse v. Frederick. So can you talk a little bit about that? And I, I sort of on purpose left out the fact that that um, Frederick was interested in suing the principal, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that part of the decision as well. Um, which part of the decision? Oh, well, just the fact that they, that part of the outcome of the, the court's decision in this case was because the principal acted reasonably that she was therefore, you know, he couldn't sue her for. Oh, you're talking about the qualified immunity. Uh, yeah. 
decision. Yeah, qualified immunity is a doctrine that is somewhat controversial, but that the uh, court has applied for a number of years now, saying that um, individual state actors, the, the, the government employees, or in this case, a teacher or principal, um, can't be held liable. Uh, they can't be sued for damages uh, for violating a rule unless the principle of law that right that, that you're arguing about is clearly established and that no reasonable um, uh, uh, state official um, would have acted in the same way uh, based on an objective test. Um, the, um, in, the, in Morris versus Frederick, uh, the court held that the principal could not be held responsible uh, in a claim for damages um, because it wasn't a clearly established right. Uh, and, um, and so uh, she was immunized. Yeah, so the school kind of won twice. The school was the school was told your your actions were good, and he can't sue you for for your actions. So yeah, so the answer to the question did the school win? Yeah, absolutely. They kind of double won. Right. Thing. Right. <laughs> and there's one other thing too, because in addition to damages, there's uh, equitable relief, is what the courts call it, and basically that means can you enjoin the state from violating your rights in the future? Can you apply an unconstitutional rule? And in that case, the doctrine of qualified immunity does not prevent the suit from taking place. But because Norris and Frederick wasn't trying to enjoin an unconstitutional rule, it was trying to seek damages for having violated rights, uh, then um, uh, you know, the, the question of whether or not there could be injunctive relief or equitable relief just didn't come up. Okay, let's take a look at the arguments in this case. So um, whenever we write up case summaries for these cases, um, I read the briefs from both sides and a brief is um, the argument. So uh, of what they would, the legal principles they wanna put forward to try to convince the court that they should decide in their favor. So um, both sides file a written brief, um, just like the amicus briefs, but they're for the parties in the case. And the court reads them very carefully. And that's why um, if you've ever listened to oral arguments in um, the Supreme Court, they don't ask a lot of factual questions because they already know, um, they've already read the briefs, they've studied the briefs, they already know what the case is really about by the time um, they have oral arguments. So they're really asking questions that sort of dig at the kinds of issues that they're going to base their decision on, not the facts. Um, so these are the arguments for Mahanoy Area School District really distilled down. As a matter of fact, um, we wrote these um, decisions at two levels, at the high school level and at the middle school level. And we're going to use the middle school arguments tonight just for, because we want to save a lot of time um, for Bob for Q&A. Um, but even if, even the high school ones are very distilled, these briefs are usually in the 40 to 60 page range. Um, they talk about a lot of precedents, not just the three we talked about. Um, and so uh, these are the five, what we felt were the most, um, most important and most strongly argued arguments. So just want to make it clear that these are not um, something that we made up. It's not even maybe the arguments that we would make if, if we thought, if we were, if we were putting forth a brief, these are the ones that Mahanoy Area School District um, put in their brief. So the, their first argument is really um, that speech that is directed at the school or causes disruption to the school environment. So we heard Bob tell us about the tinker test or the substantial disruption test. So that's what they're talking about. Um, it should not matter where the speech happens. Off-campus speech that is not about the school is not within the school's authority, but BL's speech was about the school. And she does use the word school in her, in her snap. Okay, Tinker v. Des Moines established that students do not check their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate. However, the First Amendment does not force schools to ignore speech that disrupts the school environment or invades other students' rights, even if it happens off campus. Um, so first of all, that's a misquote of the Tinker um, opinion, but we'll overlook that. 
Then their next argument is that BL's off-campus speech disrupted the learning environment at Mahanoy Area High School. Students were talking about the snaps during class time. Um, one of the other coaches was a math teacher and she said that in the middle of math class, someone was asking her, hey, what are you gonna do about BL's snap? Um, and it caused conflict within the cheerleading team. Um, it will be impossible for students to clearly define what off-campus and on-campus means. If on the weekend a student uses a private email to send harassing messages to, um, to school email accounts, is that off-campus or on-campus speech? So one of the reasons you shouldn't say off-campus speech doesn't, um, isn't controlled by Tinker is because then what is, what is off-campus these days with social media and um, teach, hybrid teaching? And the last one, schools need to be able to prevent bullying that impacts students at schools. It should not matter whether the harassment happens on or off campus. The ruling in this case will impact the school's ability to discipline online harassment and cyberbullying. So those are their top five arguments from Mahanoy. And then these are the arguments for BL. So the first one is that BL snaps were posted on Saturday off campus, not during not during any school sponsored activity and sent from BL's personal phone. The school should not have any authority over this speech. If schools have authority to discipline students' social media posts, it is like giving them authority over students' whole lives. The second one is the snaps taken on a Saturday would not still be visible by the time school started on Monday morning. This shows that Beale did not intend to disrupt school and that her snap was not the cause of the disruption, if there was a disruption in the school. And then the next one is, Beale's snaps were not public, only Beale's Snapchat friends could see the snaps. It was only visible on campus because a student took a screenshot of the snap and shared it with others. And the next one is, if the school can punish students for off-campus speech, it would teach young people to avoid saying anything that might be controversial or critical for fear of punishment. It would also undermine students' First Amendment rights. And then the last one is, even if the court does apply tinker to this off-campus speech, BL snaps were not disruptive to the school environment, and they are not substantially, substantially disruptive, so they fail the tinker test that allows schools to discipline the speaker. So Bob, do you have anything to add to those arguments before um, we open the Q&A? And, and while um, Bob has adds what he feels like he needs to add, please students feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. Uh, no, I think that pretty well sums it up. I just add one sort of note because we've been talking about these different cases and the facts that they bring up where, you know, in Tinker, you're talking about a protest of, of the Vietnam War where, you know, you've got serious student expression about a pressing national issue. And in this case, you have a cheerleader who goes off on a rant. Uh, and so some might say, well, one's an important First Amendment issue because the Vietnam War protests were serious and the other's not so important. Why is the Supreme Court to even taking up this case where you have uh, just, you know, a, a true leader who has a foul-mouthed uh, Snapchat post? Um, and, and the answer is that First Amendment cases really aren't about the merits of the speech. It's pretty well established that, you know, the First Amendment protects all speech, even speech that we consider to be uh, and not as serious or not as valuable. Uh, and uh, in this case, and in, in any important First Amendment case, the issue is power. What are the limits of government power? If the government can regulate this speech, in this case, then it can regulate any speech. And so you can imagine, even in serious political issues, and perhaps particularly in political, uh, uh, serious political issues, given how polarized a society is these days, that, um, you know, had this snap been about gun control or abortion or religion or any number of issues, you could argue that it would be just as disruptive. It's really not about the nature of the speech as it is the extent of the power that you're willing to recognize. And one last thing before Q&A, 
Um, we, I sort of skipped over earlier the lower court's decisions. So um, you made a passing reference to it, but I hadn't really explained that. Can, can you tell the students where the case was heard in the first two times and what the decisions were um, in those courts? Well, the way the federal court system works is that the lowest level of the courts are the federal district courts. They're the trial level courts. And then, uh, and they are um, 100 some uh, federal district courts. Then there's the Court of Appeals. And after a decision is made at the district court level, it goes to the Court of Appeals if there's an appeal. And uh, there are uh, 11 federal circuits. Well, 11 numbered federal, well, no, I'm sorry, 12 fe a number, uh, federal circuits because the DC circuit doesn't have a number. Um, and the appeals go to those courts and then you can petition the Supreme Court to take a, a case from the appellate level on up. And that's where we are now. The district court in this case uh, uh, sided uh, with uh, BL and held that uh, the, um, uh, the the school hadn't established that the speech was disruptive. Uh, the school district appealed that to the Court of Appeals, in this case, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and um, that court also sided with BL, but in this case decided that it was because it was off-campus speech that it wasn't reached by the Tinker Test. And so that's what led to this petition to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court granted what is called certiorari or granted the uh, discretionary appeal. Okay, so let's uh, move into Q&A. So I think Mary Liz has um, a question ready for you and uh, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. Yeah, so we know you've written an amicus brief in support of BL for the Tinkers. Can you tell us more about what an amicus brief is and what was in the content of yours? Uh, certainly. And an amicus brief, as I said, it's pronounced both ways, amicus or amicus, um, is otherwise called a friend of the court brief. And it's basically filed by uh, people who have an interest in the outcome and want to make sure that their point of view is heard. They may bring to the court's attention a perspective that they feel neither the parties has brought or they may want to emphasize their particular interest. Um, and they help the court really decide whether or not all of the issues that the case raises are being briefed by the parties. Um, uh, it has become more the practice uh, in recent years in the Supreme Court to have more and more amicus briefs on file, and particularly in high profile cases like this one, you can get quite a number of them, which can add quite a bit to the court's workload. Uh, in our case, uh, we wanted to bring to the court's attention the, the original meaning, what you thought the Tinker test was about, through the stories of John and Mary Beth Tinker because they have maintained a lifelong interest in the issue of student rights and in student free speech. Uh, they have um, uh, interacted with students ever since. Mary Beth Tinker a few years ago went on a nationwide bus tour to meet with students and talk about the issue of student free speech rights. And so because of that continuing interest in this issue ever since they were the plaintiffs in the landmark case that led to the rule, they have fought to maintain student free speech rights and have tried to argue in this case that um, uh, if you recognize an ability of the school to regulate speech for social media, you will completely undo uh, the precedent set in the Tinker case. Uh, you can't, can't really just argue that this is a slight extension of the rule to additional student speech. Because if the Vietnam War were happening today, if John and Mary Beth Tinker were in school today, they no doubt would have organized their idea for having a, a protest online through social media. They might have even, rather than wearing physical armbands, simply posted images and encouraged other students to post images of themselves wearing uh, black armbands or put a uh, black armband across the school's name or something like that. And the same arguments that are being raised now in terms of um, extending um, the school's authority over speech would apply equally to what they had done in 19, well, originally 1965, 
um, that led to the uh, decision in 1969. Um, there's also the sense of the level of disruption. People aren't quite aware of it today, but there was substantial disruption at the time caused by this simple act of civil disobedience. Um, John and Mary Beth Tinker were subjected to death threats. Their house was vandalized. Um, as in the BL case, uh, there were class discussions where teachers said that people were talking about the controversy. And, uh, you know, the level of, quote, disruption that occurred at the time um, was certainly more than what you have in this case. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court said that that doesn't rise to the level of being able to take away students' rights. Uh, the same would be true here, although now we're not talking about uh, the kinds of disruption that occurred in the Tinker case. We're talking about a, a cheerleader who was upset and told her mom. Uh, you know, you really ratchet down the level of what is considered to be disruptive in the school environment, if that's really all it takes. And so the purpose of the amicus brief in this case from John and Mary Beth Tinker was to indicate that what the meaning of the original Tinker test was and how it would undermine that test if the court were to extend the authority of the school over social media activity like this. Okay, and so how do you think the outcome of the Mahanoy case will change the way we use and view social media? Well, um, <clears throat> if the court reverses the decision below, it's going to make school authorities the full-time monitors of social media activity. I mean, there is literally nothing that would not fall within the purview of the school. Uh, the petitioners in the case argued that uh, oh, it's easy. You don't simply don't uh, communicate, uh, to, don't direct your, your online speech to other students, uh, don't um, uh, share images with anybody or things like that. But that essentially means that the only safe thing to do is to keep your thoughts to yourself and don't communicate. And so, you know, the two effects would be, if the Third Circuit's decision were reversed, uh, would be first, uh, the schools would be inundated with the task of trying to monitor social media activity. And the second would be, to the extent they did that, then um, students would be essentially under a gag rule for uh, saying anything that might cause anyone the slightest upset. Okay, and the next question, why do you think courts have ruled against the student multiple times after the Tinker case? I think it's like relating to like the other president cases that we looked at. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. The Tinker case has been described as the high watermark for um, student free speech rights. And, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to see why that's true. One is, before that case, uh, the Supreme Court had never recognized uh, uh, rights of students below the college level uh, to the extent that it did in Tinker. And ever since then, courts have struggled to apply that rule to a wide variety of different situations. As I mentioned before, the Supreme Court has only taken three cases since Tinker, and in all of those cases has sided with the school. But each of those cases were in very different circumstances where it really was part of a school activity, uh, and, and the rule that the court announced in those cases was reasonably limited. Um, in the lower courts, you find courts much more willing to recognize student rights and you have decisions going both ways. And so uh, a lot of cases in the lower courts and the district courts and in the courts of appeals, not so many that have gotten to the Supreme Court level, um, but there are many cases where courts have sided with students uh, and it's really a question of uh, uh, whether or not the Supreme Court in this case is going to err on the side of protecting speech or err on the side of bolstering the school's authority to regulate student speech. Okay, and it seems as though even though Snapchat was not intended to be disruptive, it ended up being disruptive. Should the Supreme Court value the intent of the message or the result? <laughs> well, first, it depends on what you mean by disruptive. If <clears throat> having people 
not calm down during class right away is considered to be disruptive, then there is nothing that isn't disruptive. And uh, incidentally, in this case, when the Supreme Court decides that they're not going to decide whether or not this particular snap was disruptive, what they're going to say is, uh, if they were if they were to reverse it, it would be sending the case back to the lower courts to apply whatever rule is announced here and to decide whether or not this was sufficiently disruptive. Um, there have been cases going again in the lower courts going both ways where they say that having uh, some buzz around the school is disruptive. Others have said that it, you know, that simply doesn't rise to that level. Um, and uh, again, it, it kind of depends on what the threshold is for determining what is sufficiently disruptive to um, trigger the ability of schools to, um, to regulate speech or not. Um, I think Tinker suggested that the courts would tolerate quite a bit of discussion during the Vietnam era. Um, and ever since then, courts have really gone both ways. And hopefully in this case, there will be some direction from the Supreme Court, even though they're not going to decide whether this particular snap was disruptive. They'll hopefully give lower courts some direction for how much they're, they should be willing to tolerate. Okay, so aren't there laws about acts like threat, extortion, hazing, harassment by computer, at least in Virginia, that can be used to stop bullying? Could an argument be that it should go through the police instead of through the school? Well, that's a very, I mean, it, it, that's a very good question. And it's one that cuts in a lot of different directions. Uh, first, let's talk about its application in this case, because the Court of Appeals was really quite clear that it wasn't talking about those kinds of cases. It wasn't talking about that part of Tinker that said that you can enforce rules against speech if they're going to invade the rights of others. There were really two branches of the Tinker test. One is if something invades other people's rights, and the other is whether or not something is uh, sufficiently disruptive to allow uh, the regulation. In this case, the Court of Appeals said, we're not talking about invading the rights of others. So we're not talking about bullying, harassment, threats of violence, things like that, where courts have been willing to look at speech outside the schools to see whether or not, you know, if someone calls in a bomb threat, someone says they're gonna shoot up the school, those really are questions for the criminal law uh, that, uh, um, you know, being sent to the principal's office isn't quite the right thing in, in cases like that. Um, and so that issue, the question that you raised, reverberates through this case in a variety of ways. As I say, the Court of Appeals said those more serious questions aren't involved here. We're really just talking about a school disciplinary rule to watch your mouth. Um, the uh, petitioners in this case have basically hinged most of their argument on that kind of scenario. Uh, they've basically said, if you side with the student in this case, then we can't stop bullying or, or harassment or, you know, threats of violence and things like that. And as I mentioned, I, th I think that question really isn't what this case is about. So there will be a significant question of whether or not the court goes in one direction or the other and how broadly to read what the court below did. Um, and then the, the, the other part of that question goes to the uh, last thing that you raised about whether or not these are matters for the criminal law to take care of and, and or not, or um, whether or not there should be left to school discipline. There are certain categories of speech that have been recognized by the courts as <clears throat> unprotected by the First Amendment. And they include things like uh, true threats, incitement to violence, uh, defamation, uh, certain kinds of harassment, and so on. They're simply unprotected, and they are covered by criminal laws, certain civil laws, you can sue for libel, things like that. Um, there is a remedy apart from uh, school discipline, and there are certain things like threats to the school, which really are criminal law matters and not matters to be handled uh, uh, by school authorities. Could the decision in this case have an impact on students and teachers wearing Black Lives Matter shirts, Make American Great Again hats, et cetera, in school or in social media posts outside of school? 
exactly. I mean, that, that's the exact question we're facing here. You know, uh, if a broad rule is announced saying that rude social media um, um, posts can be the subject of school discipline because they upset people, think of the number of polarizing political issues that exist out there that have passionate advocates on both sides that could become the subject of school discipline. Even if they don't mention the school, if they're directed at other students, that would be um, covered by this, this decision. So it could pertain to Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, um, pro-Trump, assuming he's still gonna be around, um, you're anti-Trump or, you know, pick your issue. It could really be uh, any issue. One of the points that we made in our brief is that there are no end to the number of kinds of things that can lead to school controversies. We cited one from a, a uh, Texas school, whether or not you could have your preferred pronoun, pronouns on your, um, on, on your online profile. That sparked a local controversy. Now, if that's enough to do so, uh, then you can imagine how all kinds of social media activity and postings would lead to arguments over what the school should regulate. How much difference do amicus briefs make? Do the justices really use them to decide? <clears throat> this is probably our last question, Bob, just so you know. Okay, well, that, that's a question that comes up a lot uh, because um, <clears throat> there are a lot of amicus briefs that frankly, I, I doubt are really read, or if they're read, they're read <clears throat> only by the court clerks. There are others that can make a difference and they will sometimes come up in oral argument questions. Sometimes an amicus brief can actually change the way the court looks at a case and change the way the court is thinking. And there are also times occasionally where amicus briefs get cited in the opinion and uh, so that you know that uh, they are making a difference. Uh, I would say most amicus briefs don't make a difference, um, but uh, on the chance that they might, um, it, it encourages a lot of people to file them, and particularly in cases where they're not convinced the parties are going to focus on the issue that is most important to them. Great, thanks, Bob and uh, Mary Liz. So we just wanted to tell you all about a resource that we have um, and some other things that we have at that page for you. So on the Street Law website, you can find the page SCOTUS in the Classroom, or you can just Google SCOTUS in the Classroom and it will take you to our page. Jen just dropped the link as well. Um, so every year we pick a couple cases that we think are particularly interesting to students, will be important cases, um, and we write them at a high school level. So it's, you know, we take this 60 pages on both sides and take it down to about four or five pages. Um, and this year we picked uh, the case we just talked about, Maho Mahanoy Area School District VBL, and we did another case, um, Coniglia v. Strom, and that case was about um, search and seizure, and uh, Torres v. Madrid, that case was about um, also seizure and um, police, excessive, excessive use of force by police and um, qualified immunity. So uh, if you go to the next one, Jen. So you, so you can get an idea. This is what we have available for Mahanoy. And we have more resources for this one than, uh, than some cases because we know that um, this was a, a, would be a really big case. Students care about this kind of thing. Um, and, and as Bob has mentioned several times, there haven't been many student speech cases. So this case will be a big deal. Um, so we've written uh, the case summaries at high school and middle school level. Um, we've, we have some other things that are more for teachers, but you could certainly look at them as students too. And then we have um, links to the briefs when there is oral arguments, you'll be able to listen to the oral arguments live because all of the arguments right now are telephonic. They don't even do Zoom, they do it over the telephone. Um, so you can listen to them live and that's really fun when you know a lot about a case. Um, in this case, the US government is also gonna share some of um, Mahanoy area school districts time. They're gonna get 10 minutes of the time that the US government's gonna weigh in on the side of the school district. Um, and then when there's a decision, we'll also post that. 
So Jen also just put in the chat a link to a CNN in interview with Brandy Levy and her dad. So if you want a little more background and you want to hear her speak for herself, um, that is a, an interesting thing to watch. We learned a lot from it, including how to correctly say Mahanoy, which we were mispronouncing. So we want to thank you so much for coming tonight. We know um, it's a big ask after most of you have been Zooming all day for classes um, or, or spending time online. So thank you so much for coming tonight. And of course, we want to thank um, our student intern, Mary Liz, for being here on her spring break. And especially want to thank um, Bob Corn Revere, who um, we couldn't have mentioned all of his the awards that he has won: um, First Amendment Litigator of the Year, First Amendment Attorney of the Year, because we would have spent the entire hour just talking about his accolades. So we really appreciate the fact that he has given his time um, to be with us tonight to help answer your questions. <laughs>